My name is uh, Deanna Church, and my current position is Senior Director of Mammalian Applications at a company called Inscripta, um, and we are a genome engineering company. I got super, super lucky because when I was in high school, I went to a very small high school in Southwest Virginia, but we had a very long and rich science fair tradition. Mm -hmm. And so I was lucky enough to actually be able to work with a professor at one of the local colleges named Mac Walford, who was a mentor to me during these processes. So I really got into science in high school, both mostly by doing science fairs. And then when I went to university at the University of Virginia, I made sure my first year I got embedded in a research lab and I got super lucky and ended up um, in the lab of Dan Burke who had just started his lab. Um, I was I was his first student as a matter of fact when he started his lab at UVA and so I did research my entire um, four years of undergraduate as well. So it was actually a series of rather auspicious events because I ended up taking a couple of years off after undergraduate and I was a technician in Boston where I was working for Alan Buckler, first when he was in the lab of David Hausman and then moved over to MGH and Jim Gasella's unit. And a large part of the work that we did, so we were doing technology development, developing a technology called exon trapping. That was one of the easier ways to identify genes at that point because there was no human genome reference assembly. And, but we were using that technology to, to try and identify disease genes. So we were involved very deeply in trying to identify the Huntington's disease gene, for instance, and, and several other genes. And so through that Huntington's disease collaboration, I'd actually met Dr. John Wasmuth, who was a researcher at the University of California at Irvine. And so when I decided that I really wanted to go back to graduate school and get my PhD, I ended up going to Irvine to work in his lab. And just as I got there, they had just been awarded one of the... Um, NHGRI, well, I guess at that point, NHGRI was not NHGRI yet. It was still a center. And um, the Wasmuth Lab had just been awarded the Chromosome 5 mapping grant, though. So we were technically a genome center, and we were responsible for mapping Chromosome 5. So my research was my research was largely focused on the, the small arm of 5, called 5P, because we were interested in trying to understand the genotype-phenotype relationship for a developmental disorder called Kredushaw. And so we had a great collaboration with a, a physician named Dr. Eric Niebuhr, who had a collection of patients. And we were working on trying to understand which breakpoints were actually really critical for giving people the sort of canonical characteristics of Krita Shah. And so, so that was the work that I had done in graduate school, so very highly related to the Human Genome Project. So I was actually building some of the back and yak contigs that were used later. But I also, you know, trying to study a developmental disorder in humans was also a bit challenging. And so I ended up going to work for Dr. Janet Rawson in Toronto for my postdoc, where she is a leader in the field of mouse developmental biology. And so the goal there was to really try and integrate more gen genomics into the study of mouse uh, developmental biology. And that was a great postdoc, except for the fact that I developed possibly one of the worst mouse allergies that Janet had ever seen. I, if I went down to the mouse room, I came back up with hives. If I stood next to somebody who'd been down to the mouse room, I would start having allergic reactions. So I realized I really needed to get out of the mouse lab in particular. And I'd started getting interested in bioinformatics at that point anyway. And so it turned out to be a great opportunity because NCBI was actually looking for somebody to come down who had genomics experience and mouse experience to help lead the effort on the mouse genome project. So this would have been right around 1999. So um, near closer to the end, like kind of getting towards the finish line of the human genome project. So when I started at NCBI, I was largely responsible for the work on the mouse genome project, but also worked on the human genome project as well to help try and finish some of that stuff up. Traditionally, the mouse has been a great model for understanding biology because we can go in, we can manipulate the mouse genome, we can control their mating. So it's been a very nice genetic model for understanding biology and systems. I think for the genome, in fact, it was also a particularly interesting model because one of the nice things about the laboratory mouse strains is they have largely been inbred. Mm 
And so effectively, these inbred strains carry a single haplotype. So they're still diploid animals, but both haplotypes are the same. So that simplifies analyzing their genome. And so the mouse was also this very interesting um, sort of experimental ground for genome assembly at the time, because you know the human the human project had really been done this very laborious mapping clone by clone method, and the mouse gave us an opportunity to actually try some of the uh, the whole genome shotgun methods as well as some of the clone based methods, so we, we could really get a really good understanding of the differences that you would get from doing, say, a whole genome approach versus a clone-based approach in the same effective organism because we could get all of this different black six sequence. So not only was it great from the experimental model system that mouse has been for, for decades, it was also useful from a genome assembly perspective because it made the problem a lot simpler. There were a couple of things. So for me, it was also really, so even though I had been in a, a genome center as a graduate student, we still operated as a small lab effectively. And so I think this was my first real like deep dive into this very large big data, big science collaborative effort. And it was also very interesting because I think a lot of people don't really appreciate how hard it is to do something for the first time. And so even though there had been genome assemblies for things like fly and C. elegans, human was a whole other can of worms. And so I remember, I think there were two things that really kind of stuck to me. The first being trying to come up with ways to QC the assembly. And so that was one of the, the projects I worked on, in fact, was could we come up with some methods for doing this QC? And this, at the time, was really new methods development because we had the first human assembly. We had nothing really to compare it to other than maps. So we did have some maps we could compare it to, but we knew we'd have some interperson variability, although at the time I don't think we expected a whole lot, and we can talk a little bit about that. But, you know, nobody had really thought about how you should do this QC. And I think, in fact, the same thing really came about when we did the first run of annotation. And, you know, one of the first runs of, of trying to annotate the genome, and there were a ton of proteins that look an awful lot like bacteria. And people, you know, it hadn't occurred to people that, oh yeah, maybe we need to do additional QC on the sequence because, and, it, and it's not that people weren't thinking, it's that, that we'd never done this before and so until you really start looking at it and you're like, oh yeah, of course you're gonna get some bacterial <laughs> contamination or maybe some other species contamination in your sequence. We need to do some checks on that in order to really make sure that we're putting together the human genome and not the human and bacterial genome. It was interesting because something of this scale had not been done. And so it was this very much this mixture at least from my perspective, it was this very interesting mixture of academic science, but production level work. And so you're trying to do this integration of things that maybe don't necessarily integrate very well. Um, I think the the notion of trying to sort of divide the chromosomes by various labs made a lot of sense at the time because of the mapping challenge, but I think it also introduced other challenges along the lines of QC, right? People People could make people could run into the same problem in different labs and make different decisions that were both in isolation arbitrarily okay, but then create this inconsistency in how the, the chromosomes were put together, for instance, right? So it was a very interesting mixing. You know, I remember at the time, Francis actually, you know, leading the conference call. So it was definitely this big mix of trying to organize across the world conference calls. I used to feel bad for the guys in Japan all the time, calling in at weird hours. But it was, you know, it was definitely before the days of of really the kind of teleconferencing that we have now. So it was it was a mix of this very regular conference calls because we were trying to do more schedule driven work, which is not as academic as as it typically happens. Um, but still trying to keep that academic and research side of it involved because, of course, this was. This was as much research and technology development as it was producing the assembly, right? And we had to try things and figure out what worked and didn't work. I think one of the advantage of the of the Genome Project is they were able to pull in several people who were interested and quite good at technology development. Um, and I think outside of you know outside of people who are, were closely involved in the project. It's unclear to me how much people really appreciate how much that project was technology development, because people people think about 
the human reference because that really is the flagship product and that's what has has sustained. But the amount of technology development that had to go in to get us to that point was was significant. Interestingly, I thought there had been some people who were really involved in some of the early sequencing technology development, like Elaine Martis and Rick Wilson at Wash U. They'd been in Bruce Rowe's lab actually trying to develop sequencing technology. So they already had this history. I think the folks at the Broad, you know, Chad Nussbaum, um, some of those folks also had a much more sort of tech dev kind of bent. And I think one of the nice things about the Genome Project is it did give a space for that kind of technology development to happen. And I think that kind of technology development happening is very difficult in your traditional R01 type funding space because those tend to be much more hypothesis driven uh, scientific endeavors, but you can't do those without the technology development. And so providing a space for that tech dev, I think is really important. Well, there was still involvement of a lot of the other centers at that point. So a lot of the main production work was going on in the, the five centers, but a lot of the smaller centers were still involved in finishing their chromosomes because that was, you know, that, that was a time, you know, people wrote papers on chromosomes at that point. So it was, in fact, very important for those labs who had contributed to those chromosome efforts to be able to do the finishing and the analysis and write the paper because that was their academic credit. Right. right. And so so many of those labs did still stay involved up and through the end. And, you know, those papers did they kind of kept coming out a little bit at a time, even after the kind of draft paper came out. Um, so the and that sort of became a little bit more distributed and less centralized because yeah. it didn't need to be as centralized. I certainly think the, you know, the race with Solera, if we want to call that, certainly helped motivate because clearly what Solera was going to put out was a draft because they, the, that technology, certainly at that time, did not lend itself to finishing. Um, but I think also there became, there, I think there also came to be a greater appreciation of the amount of information that you could get, even from a draft, right? It was still so much more information. I mean, I think one of the, one of the best and most positive things the Human Genome po Project did was start very early with a policy of data distribution. And so all of the raw sequences were already in GenBank and people could use them, but it's much easier to use them, at least if you have an assembly of some sort, even if it's imperfect. So I think the the realization that we could could learn more, and I, I think it's, you know, in retrospect as well, I think it's a it was a smart decision because I think a lot of projects suffer from trying to not go out until they're perfect. And, you know, now that I've been in industry for a few years, I understand the value, in fact, of getting things in customers' hands early because you get a lot more information from people. You, even if they're using an imperfect product, you'll get a lot more information about how it's imperfect and how it needs to improve than you would otherwise if you sit and try and figure out all by yourself how it's imperfect or not imperfect. So I think it was a really wise decision because I think we still, I think we learned a lot from those early drafts, even though they were imperfect. There were a lot of things going on at that time. I think the drive to the draft was not a bad decision. And I think the drawbacks, I think the drawbacks were not that bad from the viewpoint of, I think what ended up being a bigger problem was then we marched forward and said we had a finished genome that was not finished, right? So at least if you have something that's a draft genome that you call a draft, by the very name of it, you're sort of telling people, you know, guess what? I think it was also new enough that People were learning anyway, so so I think that the drawbacks of that decision are probably pretty minimal, and the advantage of putting the information out. I think it, it was probably much more difficult calling something a finished genome when that finished was really a technical definition, yeah. not the definition that most people think of. But I think the other thing that was actually more problematic in those early days of the draft genome was that there were really two versions of it. So there was a version that was at UCSC and there was a version that was at NCBI. And so I think that was actually a bigger problem for the community because now you had two different things that were very difficult to compare. So I think getting, getting agreement from all of the various groups to converge on a single assembly was one of the most useful things that could happen because even though the decorations or the, the annotations you might put on top of those assemblies would be different, 
at least you can now compare them because they're all in the same coordinate system. My recollection is that that was a term that came out of UCSC, but I, I could be wrong about that. That That is my recollection, um, although it could have actually also just come out of one of the meetings. But at the end, like towards the end, when people were really working fast and furious, things were happening really quickly. So it's a little bit hard to try and track some of that stuff down. I know we did not refer to it that way internally. Like we had these we, we had different files internally that we call TPF files or tiling path files. And that was what we used to track the tiling path. Um, so that was already a little bit of a, of a terminology divergence. There were a couple of different assembly approaches, even for the, the clone-based approach. So Jim Kent worked, you know, feverishly developing and you know the idea was can we take the mapping information as well as the clone overlap information from the sequences now the clone overlap information could be hard because if you had so if you had a finished back it was a little bit easier although you could still get misalignments but you could also get errors in the mapping data as well it wasn't like the mapping data was pristine and so both approaches, like there was one developed at NCBI as well as one developed at, at UCSC, and both of them tried to employ heuristics that allowed you to best evaluate both the alignments, and those get got dicier and dicier as the quality of your clone sequence got worse. So we had all of the we had all these very technical designations for clone sequences. So we would have phase one sequences, which basically just meant you had a bucket of contigs. You had phase two sequences, which asserted that we think we know the order and order of these contigs, but there's still gaps. And then phase three sequences, which were finished. And so trying to take into account the phase of the clone you're working with, what you knew about it, or it, its order from, from a tiling path or from a map, and then trying to make the best judgments about how things really went together, because you would have, you would have certainly have clones you couldn't really put into the map. You would have things in the map that had no sequence representation. So it was a it, it was a lot of, of heuristics trying to put all of that data together in the best, in the most consistent output. I think if human variation were only SNPs, we wouldn't really have any problems. Um, and so there were assumptions made about SNPs. And I think some some conclusions to that came along pretty early in terms of thinking about things like redundancy or using SNP data. I think the real challenge came in because SNPs aren't the only type of variation. And so when you have things like indels or structural variations, that really threw a bigger wrench in the assembly problem. And at the time, like there's a, uh, I give a talk on this occasionally and one of the things I really like to point to is the last five-year plan that Francis wrote and published in Science. And there's a very nice table in that manuscript that talks about what the goals in the last three years of the genome project will be. And the only real talk about variation, because a lot of them are, are technology-driven, like throughput, cost, but there's a goal of mapping 100,000 SNPs. There's no mention of structural variants. And as, a, as someone who worked on structural variants as a graduate student, I can appreciate why this is because the prevailing thought at the time was that structural variants were rare and almost always associated with highly penetrant developmental disorders. And so until those seminal papers by Sabat Niafrete and, and others that started coming out, which to be fair, could only happen because the draft genome was available. And because the draft genome was available, we could make tiling arrays so that they could go in and do population-based studies looking for copy number variation, that we began to have a an appreciation that SNPs are not the only variation in the in the so-called normal population. Um, and that was, that, that, that in and of itself, I think, shows the value because th those um, CNV papers came out in 2003, the same year as the finished genome. So, you know, that that already underscores the value of having the draft genome available because even though, you know, we would look at that data differently now, it was still very eye-opening and compelling to understand the prevalence of SVs in the human population because that was very different than our assumptions going into the genome project. HapMap 
I think did not so much really help with the structural variation, although I do think it was, I think it was very interesting in starting to open up the idea that variation in humans was more complex than we thought from the viewpoint of defining haplotypes was actually much more difficult than people realized, even from that study. Thousand genomes, I think, was was a little bit of a different scenario and a little bit more complicated. So I think, you know, again, I think Thousand Genomes was as much a technology development project as it was a variation project, although I think it made great, it provided great information about variation. The bulk of that is still small variant, SNP-based variation, although there was some effort and there were some nice papers on structural variation. Most of that is still structural very underrepresented structural variation because short reads are just inherently underpowered for studying a lot of these types of variations. A lot of the really critical work on structural variations really came out of more investigator initiated efforts. So groups like, you know, Evan Eichler's group, Mike Wiggler's group, um, Charles Lee, Jim Lepsky. So and, and some of these people, you know, Charles and, and, and Lepsky and Evan, because they had really, they did come up from a background of studying structural variation associated with disease. But then when it became apparent that this went beyond disease and that you really needed to understand the architecture, they did, a, they did a lot of heroic work in terms of methods development because, you know, you think about, so those 2003 papers were all array-based. You know, the mid-2000s, you're starting to now get like some, some selects and Illumina sequencing, but you still don't have the, the long reads that you really need to get at structural variation. So I think some of the, the work by Jeff Kidd when he was in Evan Eichler's lab to develop some of these FOSMID-based methods for identifying structural variation that I think were important because they allowed us to get not only at copy variant um, structural variation, but also copy neutral structural variation, which is very hard with short reads. Dealing with structural variations is hard, right? Like this is what makes the human reference model challenging. But also because we hadn't had this reference assembly for so long and now we had it, there was a ton of low hanging fruit and a lot of discoveries you could make really largely just looking at SNPs. And so I, I think the, the, the difficulty of dealing with the SVs coupled with the amount of information you could still get from the SNPs really kept this integration of SVs in terms of like the total map of variation from happening. And I think it's also partly driven by technology. I mean, Illumina short read sequencing dominated for a long time. And it, I mean, honestly, still dominates, right? But it's only been more recently that other technologies like PacBio, Oxford, you know, 10X linked reads, that the you StrandSeq, know, you know, there are other techniques now that really allow you to do a more thorough interrogation. And, you know, the, there's there was just a nice paper that came out led by Mark Chasen that was sort of a spinoff from the Thousand Genomes Group, which is the Human Genome Structural Variation Consortium. And I think they've done a really nice job of cataloging structural variation. Although again, in that case, they've only done it very deeply, but in three people. And it was a hugely heroic effort because of the difficulty and challenges of looking at these events. Um, partly because of the models we use partly because they're just complicated. So I think there is a, I think we're about to enter the golden age of structural variation because the it's so prevalent and it's getting too hard to ignore now. And I think the technology is there to let us look at it. I think as the technology to look at structural variants becomes easier to use and the tools, like part of this is also the tools, right? Like, um, I think we'll start to see more studies. I mean, there was a really nice study from Colby Chang um, in uh, um, out of Wash U looking at the impact of structural variants on gene expression, for instance, um, and EQTLs. And so there's people are starting to really understand that we have to understand how to study these and understand their impact on human variation. But we do need we. But on top of that, we also need good models and good tools to do that. And I and and I think those things are coming. It is quite likely that some of the missing heritability 
is lost in our inability to completely accurately genotype individuals. So you're not calling all the variants, you're not looking at all the genome. Um, so clearly some of the lost heritability it is there and they're just there and and as I mentioned, there have been some papers out more recently asserting that most of the missing heritability is in rare variation. Now, I think there's, you know, it's still early days in this area, but you would certainly expect some of that to be there. I think some of it is also in the environmental space, and some of it is also in the models that we use. So as I want to do now in, in following science Twitter, there was just this argument, or not argument, but discussion on Twitter the other day about penetrance, right? I think there's a very good argument that we don't fully understand penetrance because we haven't, you know, we haven't necessarily surveyed enough people to really understand because our, our populations that we sequence tend to get biased. Now, certainly for, for very high, we're just, and I, I think because of studies like Nomad and TopMed and UK Biobank, we're starting to get some of that data now that we can really go in and look and see, well, how many people who don't have this phenotype actually have this variant that we thought was 100% penetrant? As we sequence more people, even if it's just SNPs, like even if it's largely biased towards short read sequencing and SNPs, we're still going to gain information about population structure and variant, you know, variant distribution within the population. And all of those together, I think, are going to inform our models about the missing heritability, right? Are we really calculating it correctly? Is it the genotyping? And 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 I think the real issue is, is what proportion of each of these? Is it and and are the models that we're trying to use to look at this correct? I think it's unclear. Like I'm not even sure that the community. So I think there's room for these discussions because you know you can talk about things like penetrance and then you can talk about things like very well ex expressivity, and I'm not actually really sure how yeah, I would yeah, yeah. distinguish those two things. Even though you will see, you will see both of those terms used to, in my mind, describe different sides of the same coin. So, but I think this this is sort of related to our, you know, we have models and, you know, as the, as the saying go, goes, all models are wrong, some are useful. The models we've had, I think, have been hugely useful, but is it time to revisit some of those in terms of, and, you know, and I think Jonathan Pritchard is really doing some nice work in this area, looking at this omnigenic model and, and thinking about this, the, the complex genetic architecture, but it's still very early days for that model for us to think about how that's really going to impact our understanding of disease architecture. I was really happy to see the work done and the paper come out, right? Because it you, you could have you could certainly imagine a scenario where you have the celebrations in 2001, victory is declared, and then that hard work because that finishing work is hard and it is not glamorous. And and in fact, you know, when we started trying to look at references so when people when people would do a publication and they would actually reference the reference assembly, they would more often reference the 2001 paper than the 2003 paper, even though they were clearly using something that was a derivative of the 2003 paper. So, you know, it was clearly very unglamorous work, but important because it did show, it did start to show some of the things that we were missing in the draft. And, you know, I, I think it was, it was a much better quality sequence than the draft was, so it was a very good framework. I, I think the, I do think the use of the term finished was unfortunate, um, uh, only because I think it gave people, it gave the casual user, I guess, a sort of sense of security that maybe should not have been there. Um, and I, I think, you know, what really solidified this for me is when I would teach genomics courses, I would watch how people would use a browser and they would never have the genome tracks open. They would always have the other annotation tracks open. And so I, I would go in and start to show people what was in the genome tracks. And in many cases, we could find things like there was a big giant gap in the yeah. middle of their region, or you know, or it was a region that I knew was misassembled because we, we you know, we had been looking at this. So, so I think that was unfortunate because the because the great thing about this project is it made the reference assembly accessible to everybody, right? Especially with the work of groups like UCSC and Ensemble and NCBI providing tools, this thing that had once really been more the purview of experts really was available to a lot of people now. But then it meant because, I think because of using terms like finished, 
that people thought it had a, a quality and a completeness that wasn't there unless you really dug into it. It's not very satisfying to say the almost complete genome or the effectively complete genome, right? Like, I, I do think there are, I, I do think there are, I, I mean, I'm sympathetic to the fact that the terminology here was going to always be difficult. Um, and throughout the, I also think it's a little bit of insider baseball as well, because throughout the history of the project, we had had very technical definitions for what finishing meant at the level of the clone. And so I think that terminology that we used around the level of the clone sort of bubbled its way up as well. And so it was a, it was a, a little bit of this is the very technical thing that we think about. I mean, and, and, you know, arguably as well, it really marked the end of the, it marked the finishing of the HTP, right? Like the work, there, there were a couple of years where there was really no or very little work done on the reference assembly. So it was finished from that perspective because the project was finished. Um, so I, I think the word had multiple meanings at that point. I think broadly people were okay with it because in the, you know, every once in a while you'd get like, hear somebody rumble about centromeres or telomeres. But I think most people really appreciated that those were going to be very technically difficult. I also think that a lot of people thought that the sequencing that was missing, and, and most people really tended to think about it more in terms of the sequencing that was missing, not necessarily sequence that was misassembled. But I think the thought was that because so much of that was repetitive, that maybe it was okay, like, and, and in fact, you know, lots of good science that got done on that reference assembly. And as long as you really understood the questions that you could ask and answer with that assembly, it was a great resource, right? And the current, I mean, the current assembly is much the same way. It still has limitations, but as long as you understand those limitations, you can really answer some very important questions. So I, I don't think at the time people really thought a whole lot about it. Well, because sequencing heterochromatic sequences at the time, we really, well, okay, let me rephrase that. We could sequence heterochromatic sequences, but we could not put them together because they're so repetitive that trying to put, trying to make any sense of them. And there's a great paper. So Karen Miga started when she was in Hunt Wendler Lab. Now she's at UCSC, really did a nice demonstration of how difficult it was to look at these by taking some of the data from the Venter assembly. So she could have, um, a male so she could look at the X chromosome and the Y chromosome centromeres knowing that she only had a single copy because centromeric sequences can be polymorphic and demonstrated the difficulty of trying to reconstruct those centromere sequences from that from that data. So I think you know there's been some nice demonstrations about why this is challenging. I think it's a hard question because you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. Well and I and I can definitely I, I I will say I think I was even the ones one of the ones who was kind of like well if we can't sequence the centromeres like is it that big a deal and then once we got Karen's data and we started trying to map you know because we we've always sort of had these sequences that we carried along with the human reference that we, we were pretty sure they were human but we didn't know where they went and once we had the centromere models from Karen we could start mapping some of these unlocalized sequences into the centromeric sequences. So it became quite clear there were in fact little islands of some euchromatic sequence buried in these deeper arrays. So that would suggest that that we were in fact wrong and that sequencing these could be important. But you know, it's again, it's a, you don't know what you don't know, right? Like you go back to the beginning of the human genome project and we thought human variation was very minimal. So we made decisions, right? Yeah. So, you know, this is this is why it's great that you get, you know, individual funded lab doing this really hard work. Now I think there is a much bigger appreciation for the importance of trying to really do a tip to tip chromosome and really get that kind of information. But that's relatively new. You know, one of the things that we did find really early was that one of the one of the main challenges that was driving some of these gaps. So we knew so we knew some of the gaps were driven by segmental duplication, right? So you'd get in to the end, you'd have these segmentally duplicated sequences and you just could not walk out because you were too repetitive to have confidence in the sequence that would go next. But there were there was another class of gap that I think was slightly more insidious, which was driven by structural variation. And so one of the the very early examples that we found of this was 
an actual SV that we knew to be segregating in the, po- in the population. And the donor sequence that we used was heterozygous for that event. And so we ended up putting both haplotypes in the assembly and that created a gap because the two haplotypes didn't overlap. And so we, once we started looking at this, and, and you know, a lot of this was work driven not just by the folks in the, in the Genome Reference Consortium, but also work from Evans Lab, work from folks at the Sanger, you know, lots of, of individual labs looking at loci that they cared about deeply, that we realized that this was a very common class of gap in the earlier versions of the reference assembly, mm-hmm. was this, this, if the donor is heterozygous for a structural variant, you can get a haplotype expansion. When we did the update from GRCH37 to GRCH38, that was, there, were, there were two things that we really focused on, one of which was trying to fix those those gaps. And it was a, it was probably about half the gaps in the reference assembly were driven by that sort of phenomenon. And also fixing smaller problems that had been identified by the clinical testing community in medically relevant labs. So for example, there were two, two or three coding exons from Shank 3 missing, and it was actually a clone assembly problem, not a, not an assemb- not a bigger assembly problem. Um, so I think a lot of those, and I won't say there are none of those left in the reference assembly, but several of them have been solved. We couldn't get to all of them because the way that we addressed a lot of these regions is that we had access to a single haplotype resource. So there are cell lines called CHM1, CHM13, these are derived from hydidiform moles. So hydidiform mole occurs when a sperm fertilizes an enucleated egg or or the one of the nuclei get, or the paternal nuclei gets kicked out after fertilization and that paternal genome endoreduplicates. So now you get two copies of the genome and the cells will start dividing. Um, but this is this is not a productive pregnancy. And so there has been an effort um, to try and collect some of these cells to make cell lines. Now, in many cases, the genome duplication is not complete. And so you actually get more of an aneuploidy type genome. But there are cases where you get what looks like a pretty good copy, like a cytogenetically normal copy of the human genome. And so CHM1 and CHM13 fall into that. So in these regions where we know knew that there was structural variation or repetitiveness, segmental duplications, we would try and go back and retile them in this CHM1 where we had a back library for this as well, because we could at least eliminate haplotypic variation because we only had one haplotype available to us. And so we could, it, it, we sort of, it sort of allowed us to turn the human into a mouse at that point because we could, <laughs> yeah. we could be more stringent on the overlaps and, and, and do a little bit better job. But that was still very it's tedious and la- laborious work because the repetitive regions, even in a single haplotype, can still be challenging to put together. You need map resources, you know, a lot of the newer technologies, things like BioNano and the long read technologies were actually pretty valuable for those kind of efforts. I think, so I, I, I was not at AGBT this year, but I was very closely following the work of Adam Philippi and Karen Miga oh. at that discussion. And so, so I am optimistic that there will be at least one telomere to telomere assembly. I, I, I think the, the read lengths are there. Now, will these be perfect assemblies? No, because I do think like there is a, there is sometimes a, a an overemphasis on contiguity that overlooks some of the other smaller errors that can happen in an assembly um, that lead to to inappropriate protein sequences or you know frame shifts in protein sequences. So will they be perfect assemblies? It's unclear. Um, but I think and, and will it be a routine operation? That I think is also unclear how routine it will be in five years. But I certainly think it will be doable in five years. I think it'll be huge because we don't know what we don't know. And starting to survey these more diverse populations all the way at the assembly level is important because the the real challenge with a reference-based approach is that when you have sequences 
in the genome you want to assay that are not in your reference, they are, they are, they are, there are two things, in fact. They're either invisible or they actually will align to something that looks like it in your reference and create problems in your analysis. So, and I think getting more of that diverse representation, there's enough data out there now showing that we're missing some amount of, some indeterminate amount of sequence um, from various populations. And so starting to understand what that look like looks like, I think is important. I also think it's important because if we want to try and develop tools that better model the human genome, however we're going to define the human genome, whether it's an individual genome or a population representation of a genome, we need those sequences to actually help with that tool development because you can't do tool development without that data. So this came about, this was, this would have been, I'm, I'm hesitant to say the year because I'm going to get it wrong, but you know, a year or two after the finished paper, finishing paper, and actually you and I were both at a structural variation conference that was over at the Sanger, what at the, what at the time was the Sanger Center. I don't think it had become the Sanger Institute quite yet. Um, and so it was a relatively small meeting of folks that were looking at structural variation. Um, and one of the things that was becoming quite apparent to this group is that in addition to discovering structural variation within the population, they were also finding errors in the reference assembly, which makes sense, right? Like if you, if you look, if, if you're looking at variation and every person you look at is different than the reference, the reference is either a very, very rare allele or it's wrong. So, and they were, they were finding this pretty substantially. And there was a bit of frustration because there was, none of them knew who to talk to about trying to get it fixed. Right. Like even if you even if you really only found a problem on one chromosome, you would have to know which genome center had done that chromosome. And the chances that the person who had done that work was actually still at that genome center was dodgy at best because, you know, people people moved on with their scientific careers. Right. And so so that was was problematic. And so you and I started talking about this and we're like, you know, this was a really big effort. It seems it seems wasteful to not put some resources into trying to improve the reference, right? Like this is a, this is a really standing important resource for the community. And, you know, I think the, the really important thing about the reference, so many people think about the reference as just a comparator for other genomes, but the reference is also the standard on which we hang all of our biological knowledge, right? It's where we put our gene annotation. It's how you compare and it's how you put other you know, regulatory information knowledge, right? Like it, it, it's our repository of annotation in addition to our comparator for other genomes. And so you and I discussed this and we, we realized that we thought this was a very important thing to establish. And so we each went back to our kind of respective funding agencies and institutions and we're like, guys, we think we should put together a group whose job it is to continue working on this. And it turned out, in fact, that that really the Sanger, as well as Wash U, were actually still doing some work in this area. So they were, you know, the, the chromosomes that they had been responsible for, they were still fixing problems and doing things with. So when we really, you know, when we finally got approval and, and the welcome and NHGRI were like, yes, this does seem like a good idea to start this group. It was very easy to pull in Wash U and the Sanger because they were already kind of working in this area anyway. And it was very clear that we needed, this was not just a bioinformatics effort, this was gonna be a sequencing effort as well. Um, and the timing really, the timing was really kind of good because this was happening near the end of when we were finishing up the mouse sequence. And so, you know, the mouse assembly effort had been a much smaller, more focused team. And we had learned a lot about what had happened from the human reference. And one of the things that my group at NCBI had done along with some other, with other groups is we had really put a lot more automation and databases into place. And so it seemed like a natural fit that we could pull the human genome now into a bunch of these resources that we had pulled together to try and make this more central and more standard and easier to deal with from a curation perspective, not just a development perspective. And we also thought it was very important as well to set up resources where we could 
actually record and make all of the evidence for how the assembly was put together available for people with the understanding that most people don't care, right? If you're looking at the whole genome, you probably don't really care about the evidence that two clones go together. But if you are looking at one region very deeply, you actually might care or, you know, this could be important to, to what you're doing. So we wanted to be very open, transparent. We wanted to have a gateway for the community to actually tell us things that were wrong. Um, even though that has not been used very much, um, it's still there now. So if people find a problem that they want to report, there's a way that they can do this and then they can follow their report through the process of curation. And all of the curation that happens is open and publicly available for people to see. And we thought that was hugely important for the resource. So to be honest, I think that the thought of doing the telomere to telomere assembly is, is cool. But I think I find that less important than actually getting assembly level representations from a much more diverse representation of the world's population. Mm -hmm. um, because I think, I, I, and it's not that I don't think the centromere, telomere, heterochromatin is not important. I think it's, I think it's important. But I think the representation of a more global population is hugely important, uh, it, it is, is more important because even without a tip to tip assembly, I'm betting that we could use that information now to help improve analyses, to help improve potential you know, care as people actually use the reference assembly in clinical ways. Um, so I, w I, I would love to see a commitment from the Institute to help support the sequencing of those diverse populations. And I think it really needs to be a global effort, right? It really needs to be um, Asian, African, like we need that global diversity because we really need a very good survey uh, of that. So that would be the thing that I think is critical. The other reason I think that's critical is that I think it's clear that we need a better assembly model. So the challenge that we have faced, and, and this all goes back to our initial assumption that human variation was limited. You know, in another talk I give, I have a slide where I show a karyotype. Right? We all have two copies of each chromosome, except for our sex chromosomes. You have one copy of X and Y. I have two copies of the X. Um, but yet, when you see an assembly representation, it's only ever one copy of each chromosome. And it's because we decided that we could have this sort of haploid consensus model. And if the only type of variation you have is SNP variation, so if the sequences you're looking at are basically like each other and like the reference, that totally works. But if sequences are more diverse, it falls over. And, you know, and, and the challenge here, and I think this is a significant challenge for the community. One of the reason that reasons that people like the haploid consensus model is that it is easy. And we have a lot of tools that are built around it, right? We have, we have almost two decades of tools built around this particular model. So if we are going to develop a new model, not only does it have to be almost as easy as the current model is, it has to provide significant additional scientific benefits, right? So people not only have to see the benefits, they have to be able to use it. And that I think is challenging because now you're really talking about a much more complex, probably population style model um, that will likely require a significant level of abstraction for most people to use. And I think in fact will require the expertise of people who are maybe outside the field of biology. I think we need people who really focus on data structures and, and computational bio, not, not just computational biology, but computation, computer sciences and data structures, because I, I think that the, the complexity here needs to be simplified in order for people to use it. And so that's my big fear, in fact, is that the models will end up being so complicated that people can't use them. And so, people stay with an inferior model because they can at least use it. So I think that is really the big challenge to the field is how do we get to a place where we have a much better model, but that it is accessible enough that people can use it.